Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon from wherever you have joined from. Thank you for joining our flagship event, Premier Wednesday, hosted by, sponsored by Premier Agile. So, as you know, Premier Agile is a consulting and a training organization for several programs, especially in the Agile and Scrum space. And as part of the initiative to give back to the community, we offer Premier Wednesday as a platform for people to join, learn, share, network on different topics. Now today, we are gonna have a very, very different topic than what we have been doing in the last four years. This topic is about space systems, something that is very, very uh, focused on, you know, aerospace, aeronautical kind of systems. I'm not sure I'm a beginner in this. So we have our uh, speaker, Siddharth, uh, who is pursuing this field of study. And uh, he's a class 12 student, and this is his uh, great interest. So today he's here to share with some of the insights about space systems, certain overview and things like that. So we are doing these events on an ongoing basis. Now, this is something very, very different. We have not done before, and we are gonna do something very diverse like this. And if you check out our website, premieragile.com, you will also figure out that uh, we are doing several such events in the upcoming weeks as well. So I request all of you to kindly register for these events uh, by joining our website, www.premieragile.com, or even following us on LinkedIn and we announce these events there as well. Yeah. With no further delay, I'm going to hand over to Siddharth and he will introduce about himself, about the topic and take us through some of these uh, concepts. Thank you all and happy learning. Hello everyone, or good evening. Myself Siddharth Ushras Kondaru. And today I'm going to be talking about one of the most important topics in aerospace engineering, which is space systems. Now, before we get into this, I'd like to talk a bit about myself. So, like I said, my name is Siddharth Kondaru, and I plan on taking up aerospace engineering in my BTEC because I've been interested in aerospace engineering ever since I was a kid. Like reading about space, reading about spacecrafts has always interested me. And I used to it was one of the most intriguing things for me. Now, now let's go ahead. Now, and let's see what aerospace engineering really is. Now, aerospace engineering deals with the development of spacecrafts and aircrafts. So it has two branches, aeronautical engineering and astronautical engineering, where aeronautical engineering deals with the development of aircrafts and astronautical deals with the development of spacecrafts. So yeah, with that aside, let's begin. Okay, so we are here at the introduction page where we talk about what space systems really are. So space systems are vehicles and infrastructure that work in a particular space environment uh, to perform a particular task. So space systems have a lot of uses. So take a satellite for example. A satellite is sent into space for weather forecasts, communication, mobile communication, and reading and observing certain celestial bodies and observing the natural resources of work. Yeah, so stuff like that. So space systems, like it says, improves our knowledge on physical universe through celestial observation and planetary exploration. And the artificial satellite example, which I already gave you up, applies. And another example would be spacecraft where astronauts go into the space and they collect specific information on a planet or to see if there's life on another planet. That is advanced information that they have to go in person and collect. So these are the contents. We're, these are the topics we're going to be talking about. The space environment, the space communication, space power systems, spacecraft thermal control, nanosatellite conceptual design, uses of space systems, space systems technology. Okay, so let's get into the first topic, the space environment. So we are going to be studying about the environment in which these spacecrafts and satellites are gonna be 
sent into. So space environment deals with the phenomena in space that affects the spacecraft and launch vehicles. Now, there's a common belief that space is filled with nothing but vacuum and there's nothing inside space, which you might be, it might be correct for the most part, but the space environment is rather dangerous as spacecrafts that are sent into space are exposed to a range of hazards, including intense particle and electromagnetic radiation to the lower Earth orbit. Now, Earth orbit has a few parts. Now, lower Earth orbit is the part of the Earth's orbit, which is 1,000 kilometers above in altitude from the Earth. Now, there's another thing. Apart from this, space communications and radio navigations must account for the propagation of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, these electromagnetic waves are, uh, and rays are coming from the sun itself. You now, so they must account for such electromagnetic waves in the ionospheric plasma in the upper layer of Earth's atmosphere. You must have already studied about the Earth's atmosphere being divided into four parts. So, yeah. Now, let's get to the next slide. Okay? So let's talk about gravity. You might already know what gravity is. It's one of the most basic concepts in physics, but we'll talk about it anyway. Gravity is the attractive force between two objects proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Yeah, you might have already studied about this during your school days. And Earth's G value is 9.8, which you already might know. And the universal gravitational constant also you might have studied 6.67 to 10 to the power minus 11 meter cube, kg inverse, and second square. So gravitational force is attractive force between two objects. So yeah, Newton first discovered gravity upon the apple being, being fallen to the ground from a tree. You must have already heard about that story. So many, like I said, many people think that in space, uh, there's nothing inside the space apart from vacuum. So people also think that there is no gravitational force in space but that is not true at all since gravity is present in every part of the universe. It is just, a, the force is just a lot weaker than the Earth's gravitational force. So there's a fun fact here. You might have watched in movies that astronauts keep floating inside spacecrafts. Like, yes, yeah, so, so about that. So microgravity is a condition in which people or objects appear to be weightless. This is most commonly found in spacecrafts. NASA, ISRO, and other space agencies study microgravity to know what happens to humans in space. For example, muscles and bones break weaker without gravity, making them work as hard. So yeah, microgravity is an important field of study which helps you know what happens to humans outside space and they conduct missions based on that information, which can be really helpful. Okay, so let's talk about the Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is made up of neutral gases, whose temperature, density, and pressure profiles as a function of height and can be understood in terms of physical concepts. Now, the composition of the Earth's atmosphere is dominated by Earth's gravity and solar radiation. Near the ground, the atmosphere contains 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen by volume, and rest 1% consists of other small gases. And these are just basic concepts which you might already be aware of. The temperature of the atmosphere varies with altitude, and this is the basis for dividing the atmosphere into different regions. Like I said, the atmosphere has different regions, right? They are troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. So they are divided based on the Earth's altitude. Beyond the exosphere lies the space. Now, space communication. Now, we all need communication to share our ideas, to speak to people. And thus, we perform this task of communications with, with many people. And just like how a pilot needs the communication from the ground station for the proper running of the aircraft or to go in a particular direction or to know which direction to go, the pilot needs such information. Right? The space can, the same can be applied to spacecraft as well. Spacecrafts must receive operating commands and data from the ground and return the data back to Earth. The communications are so important that they can make or break a mission as one miscommunication and the entire diet of the mission can be changed. If, a, if some information is not transferred properly, so in that case, it, it, can, it can fail the mission sometimes but those are very rare circumstances. Well, like I said, the two types of communications are the 
information that is sent from the ground station to the spacecraft and the information that is received from the spacecraft from the outer space. So the two types of communications are the ones that go back and forth each other to ensure the smooth procedure of the mission. Space communication links share many characteristics with their terrestrial counterparts, but there are also a few differences. Slant ranges between the spacecraft and, and the ground are typically large. The signals received from the spacecraft can be incredibly weak sometimes since the spacecraft is moving at a high speed relative to the ground station. Yeah, so that makes sense, right? Even, even when a pilot is flying the plane, the signals that are received from the pilot will be significantly weaker than the, uh, than the ground station signals that are sent to the pilot. This causes the received frequency to differ from the transmitted frequency by a significant Doppler shift that is proportional to the rate of change of slant. Now you may be wondering what a Doppler shift is. Doppler shift is a change of frequency uh, due to the Doppler effect. Now you also may be wondering what is a Doppler effect? Well, you might have already studied this in intermediate like I have. The Doppler effect basically states that when two objects are moving towards each other, the frequency of the waves emitted by those two objects will be higher as they move, as the closer they move to it, towards each other. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is space power system. For any device to work, it needs power, right? That's obvious. The space, the same can be applied for space power systems. Reliable continuous operation of power system is essential to successful fulfillment of a spacecraft mission. A failure, even a brief interruption in source of power can have really bad consequences. Yeah, that is obvious, right? If certain part did not get enough power, then it does not function properly and it may cause the part to fail. Uh, and it's really hard to fix this issue. And thermal control as well as its electrical systems. And there isn't really much to do to mitigate this once it does happen, like I said. Therefore, the space power, the spacecraft must be provided with uh, crucial power and ne necessary power and must be made sure not to go beyond or lower than what is required. Now, energy sources. So the power is re received from something that is basically just called an energy source. Every electrical power system source consists of primary energy source and an electrical energy con energy converter, energy storage and regulation and distribution. So an example for primary energy source would be the directly from the sun, the sun rays coming directly from the sun. The converter transforms energy from an available form to more useful electrical form. Three basic conversion types that are used for generation of power in space are solar, nuclear, and electrical. In some cases, the primary source and the converter are a single device. Yeah, so you can see in solar cells that that the rays from the sun are sun is taken from the solar cell, taken by the solar cells and some electrochemical sources, and it directly converts the uh, energy from the sun into electrical energy, which can be beneficial for solar cookers and stuff like that. Now there is an exception to stuff. There is an exception where nuclear energy, the nuclear energy from the nuclear sources are have to be uh, have to be converted to electrical energy by a mediator by an, or by an electrical converter. Now spacecraft thermal control. Now we just talked about how power is required for the working of the spacecraft. Now, what if excessive power is supplied or excessive heat is supplied to the spacecraft? It will obviously falter, right? The spacecraft parts will obviously falter. Or what if uh, below required uh, below required power or heat is given? It will also call it will also fault. So that is why the function of space thermal control subsystem in a space flight program is to control the temperature of all the individual components throughout the entire mission, including ground launch and flight operations. Of course, it is required because uh, for the proper for the proper going proceed, proceeding of the spacecraft mission, this uh, these thermal control is really, really important. The temperature control is an important part of the operation of many spacecraft. The spacecraft are thermally designed to be able to balance the benefit received from the equipment operating at a certain temperature and with a few resources. The equipment can be made to function with stability in that certain temperature. 
Now, spacecraft's equipment is designed in such a way that it will always balance out uh, the unneeded power and uh, or the excessive power uh, or the excessive power or it can also give provide more powers so that the so that the part works properly. So electronic equipment is designed in such a way that there exists a certain temperature limit to prevent the equipment from failing due to overheating or freezing in the respective operating temperature. Now, these are the components or subsystems in a spacecraft and their operating temperatures and the temperatures in which they can either freeze or get overheated and fail. You can have a look at them. So, as you might have seen, the general electronics operates around the temperature of minus 10 to 45 degrees Celsius, and its survival temperature is minus 30 to 60 degrees Celsius. So, any lower than minus 30 degrees Celsius will cause it to fail, or any higher than 60 degrees Celsius will cause it to fail again. So, the next is the batteries. Batteries operate from 0 to 10 degrees Celsius, and their survival temperature is minus 5 to 20 degrees Celsius. Infrared detectors operate from minus 69 to minus 73, and their survival temperature is minus 69 to 35. So here the, they operate from minus 69 said, and the survival temperature is also minus 69. So it has to be perfect in here. See, like the heat that is provided to the infrared detectors must be perfect, and and it should not be less than minus 269 because it can fail and it can also not pro function properly. Solid state metal detectors, solid state particle detectors, minus 35 to zero is the operating temperature and minus 35 to 35 is the survival temperature. And for motors, it is zero to 50 and survival temperature is minus 20 to minus 30. For solar panels, which we just talked about, minus 100 to 125 is the operating temperature and survival temperature is minus 100 to minus 125. Okay, we are going on to the next slide. Now, nanosatellite conceptual design. Now, we've talked about space systems and its spacecrafts. And we've also talked about how satellite is a part of space system. Now, what exactly is a nanosatellite? Nanosatellite is a smaller version of a, of a regular satellite, which weighs from one to 10 kilograms. It is significantly smaller and significantly or less significantly lighter. The conceptual design is the initial step in the description of the space system in which the overall mission requirement are defined. The mission is described, a concept of operation defined, subsystem specifications determined, and initial characteristics and performance of each subsystem assessed. Now, only with this information can you design a proper satellite not just nanosatellite or not just spacecraft. You have to be given some certain information and certain conditions that these satellites must meet in order for them to function properly and what the mission really is and what the mission really is focusing on to achieve. So designing nanosatellites have really good benefits. So they come with a low cost and short and development time, hence making it very feasible yet effective, thanks to the falling cost of miniaturization of the and nanosatellites weigh around 1 to 10, 10 kilograms. How long does it take to design a nanosatellite? So you may be wondering, since it's small, it may take very less time. Yeah, that's true. So designing nanosatellites come with the benefit of short development time. Like I said, nanosatellites can be developed in less than eight months, including all the identification and planning. So. A regular satellite would take around five to 15 years to be developed. 
that's a lot more than how much time nano satellites are developing right that's why nano satellites are really effective in addition to guarantees of redundancy and robustness nano satellite constellations provide a system in which the concepts of oppositions or useful life are no longer an issue so it will tell you when its limit is done when it has reached its limit so you don't have to worry about sending the old satellites into space and not expecting much or not getting much results because nano satellites will give you the sign of its robustness and obsolescence that is why nano satellites are really really preferred to regular satellites nowadays now how much does a nano satellite cost depending on the specifications a nano satellite can be built and built and placed in an orbit for uh, 500000 euros or 4 crore indian rupees so yeah nano satellite so 4 crore indian rupees you may be thinking that's a lot but like regular satellites go for like 500 million euros, which is a lot more than that so yeah this is relatively better the lower cost of a nano satellite does not mean they are less reliable like we just like we just discussed with the right methodologies during both satellite design and testing phases the success of a mission can be guaranteed leaving only incidents that are not that cannot be controlled lead to failures such as launch failures solar storms or impact of a meteorite yeah such unfortunate errors can happen because you cannot control the meteorite that is traveling towards the earth right you cannot control that something that's not in your hands so yeah some so yeah only un, un only what unlucky sir unlucky circumstances like that will cause to the failure of a nano satellite mission now let's talk about use of space systems we talked about what factors are required for the space systems to work properly and the nano satellite conceptual design and why nano satellites are better than regular artificial satellites so let's talk about the uses of these nano satellites i already told you about give a brief explanation about the uses of space systems at the start but we are going to go over it again many common everyday services for terrestrial use such as weather forecasting remote sensing satellite navigation satellite television and some long distance communication systems rely on space systems like i said at the start the space systems also help us improve our knowledge on outer space and celestial bodies they help us study the earth more effectively as being able to observe the earth from top gives us an idea about natural resources you know there is there is like this thing where people cannot people cannot get the full uh, full potential of the natural resources that are given in, that are in the earth so space systems help in this regard as they can track natural resources and make humans uh, utilize these natural resources to their fullest they provide good employment to people thus contributing to the economy of a country that is another that is another benefit of space systems though it's not as prominent as the other benefits okay so let's talk about space systems technology across the world so first we have us us accounts for over 30% of the operational space craft currently in orbit around the world the nation launched its first satellite in, into space in february 1958 and currently operates a large fleet of communications electronic intelligence mission mission detection weather technology navigation and surveillance satellites nasa operated some popular missions such as apollo moon landing operation the skylab space system space station mars exploration rover these are some of the achievements of nasa which you might have already heard of it's very it's very common and popular uh, space agency one of the leading space agencies in fact in the world these are these achievements of nasa and let's talk about china for the second one china has world's large, second largest fleet of spacecraft only behind nasa constellations of navigation satellites remote sensing satellites communication satellites surveillance satellite and spacecraft in operation the cnsa which is the chinese uh, Na- chinese nasa the chinese space agency is the main operator that has operated tiangong 1 space station shenzhou manned space flight program 
and the chinese lunar exploration program these are these are like really good missions it is really successful missions that the chinese have operated and till this day it remain one of the most successful missions most successful missions so let's talk about india for the third point india started its space mission in 1975 india currently operates the insat and gsat series communication satellites earth observation satellites and ir mss series navigation satellites isro also operated the mars orbiter mission yeah they are you know about mission mogul right it is one of the biggest success of india so next japan launched its first satellite osumi into space in 1970 Japan now operates a fleet of communications, meteorological, earth observation, and astronomical observation satellites. Japanese is also really, uh, really has good technology for space systems, um, though it may pale in comparison with U.S. and China. But Japanese still have a really good space systems technology. Major Japanese programs are Japanese Experiment Module (KIBO) slash ISS. H two transfer vehicle, K O Contonori five, H T V, and H two launch vehicle. You know these are just the missions that Japanese have accomplished thus far. All right, so that's all I have. So thank you for listening to me in this webinar. Um, I was really nervous about it, but I I I learned to express myself more by speaking in this webinar. I know this is a little bit different than the premier Wednesday you people have every Wednesday. So yeah, so to everyone who wants to pursue aerospace engineering, I'm just gonna say that even though it might be hard, yes, people have said that aerospace engineering is hard, which is true for the most part. It is harder than computer science engineering or mechanical engineering. But if you have the passion for it, you can achieve it. I believe it. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please drop it in chat. Okay, so let's wait if anyone has any questions before we wind up the session. Okay, so no questions, uh, no problem. So, thank you everyone for joining. I just I'll take a few minutes before uh, we close this uh, session out. Uh, this is recorded, by the way, in case anyone would like to watch again or maybe share it with your friends. We are going to upload the recording on our YouTube channel as uh, well as other social media channels that we have. Uh, Siddhar, thank you so much. uh especially those last few words that you have shared with all of us this is very very inspiring yes we all understand aerospace is one of the toughest subjects uh, but then uh, you know with passion we can get there is something that you have kind of uh, giving a message very very good for all of us but for the uh, participants who joined us thank you for joining and listening into a very very different topic than the regular premier wednesday event uh, just a quick uh, Uh, information here for those who are interested to join our future events uh, you know agile and non agile topics one place to find them is on our linkedin and uh, the schedule if you wanted to see this is available on our website premieragile.com uh, so both the links are there on the chat so kindly click those and follow us on one of some of those uh, social channels and from a schedule perspective the next premier wednesday event is going to be on august 24th and that is an agile topic which is more of the agile metrics how do you track metrics for agile teams so that's it uh, for now any feedback any comments that you have kindly go ahead and share it on the chat please this will definitely inspire us in terms of giving back to the community by making doing more of learning like this 
and it will also motivate our speakers who are across the globe and Siddharth will definitely draw some inspiration from any feedback that you have. Please go ahead. We will wait for two minutes. So you can write your feedback, any few notes on the chat. I see already Ravi Teja and Sai Sushant. Uh, thank you for your feedback. Anyone else uh, who would like to say a word or two about the session, please go ahead. We have received some notes on the, on the chat. Uh, thank you so much. They will inspire us and the speaker as well. Thank you, everyone. And see you on the next Premier Wednesday. Till then, have a great week. And bye-bye. Uh, bye for today. Thank you.